and anybody else out there in um, online land. My name is Kelly Van Emmen, and I am the Associate Principal Oboe Player of the Spartanburg Philharmonic, and I'm also the Professor of Oboe and Musicology at Converse College. I wear a few other hats as well, but those are the two relevant ones as we go. Uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what you might guess is my favorite instrument. That would be this guy here, the oboe. Now, I've been playing the oboe for years. Actually, I worked it out uh, one day with one of my students not too long ago, and I think it comes out to 38, almost 39 years, which means that by this point in time, it's a little bit hard for me to know what it is that people want to know about the oboe. You know, it's kind of like somebody asks you, what's interesting about yourself? And you're like, I, I don't know, right? So I did a very 2020 thing. I went to the internet. Specifically, I went to social media, went to Facebook, and simply posted a query amongst my variety of friends in Facebook. What do they want to know about the oboe? So we're going to work through some of these questions. And thank you so much to all of my Facebook friends. OK, so Kevin says, is there a reason why the oboe sits precisely where they do in symphonies? So when you go to the Spartanburg Philharmonic the next time we have a concert, because you're going to come, right? Um, because you could eventually go places. Um, you'll notice the oboe player sits in the smack dab middle of the orchestra. Strings are in front, winds are in the back, oboe's right here, conductor is right here. Beeline to the conductor. Uh, but part of that is that the first chair violin, the concert master, is in effect kind of the most in charge person amongst the music, uh, amongst the instrumentalists in the orchestra. But the oboe is the next most important in there, I think. It's kind of like the king and the queen of the orchestra. Um, we tune the orchestra. Uh, we sort of act as a focal point between the conductor and the rest of the winds. So you're right there in the mid in, uh, in the midst of it. Along those same lines. Uh, friend asked, um, because you sit in the middle of the orchestra the way you do and you're right in front of the conductor, do you find yourself emoting more to bring more attention to yourself? Answer to that, Sanu? No. No. I emote a lot when I play solo, but in the orchestra, it's not about me, it's about us. wants to know what exactly is a double about a double reed. Ha ha. This is an old dying reed. You'll be able to see because it's falling apart. All right. But that means I can take it apart. So if you look here, can you see that? There's two pieces of reed, two separate pieces of reed. And there's the two different reeds right there. If you're very lucky, they are symmetrical. And that's where the sound actually comes from. All the sound is just made on this. It's like, did you ever play a piece of grass when you were a kid? It's like that, but two pieces of grass, right? So you're causing them to vibrate. And as we all know from our acoustics class in college, uh, what do you need to have sound? Vibrations. This kid's gonna help. Okay, what else does Kevin want to know? Is there a minimum or maximum for how hard one can blow into the oboe? Well, yes and no, if you don't blow hard enough. You don't make anything move. If you blow a little bit harder. And the harder I blow, Sometimes you can make it squeak. It's hard to make that mistake on purpose, though. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, what else do you want to know? Do lefties hold or play oboes differently than right-handed folks? Are there left-handed version of oboes? To my knowledge, no. That left hand on top, 
right hand on bottom. Actually, my clarinet uh, clarinet professor when I was in college, before you'd walk out on stage for a recital, he would always give you the very helpful advice. Remember, left hand on top. Thanks, Dr. Shanley. But what's really interesting is the earliest oboes from about 1600, they didn't have all of this key work. They had actually, it looked like a recorder with two keys on the bottom, this one and this one. But this one was fishtailed so that you could actually play it left hand on top, right hand on top. But the more keys you got, the less flexible it got. So that happens. Let's see, what else we have? Are there youth-sized oboes? There's a smaller oboe called the musette. I'm not really sure anybody wants to hear it. It's kind of like having a piccolo in the house, but with a reed. Okay, this one typically jumps right into the oboe, or other instruments generally considered preparatory for it. Actually, this is sort of interesting. So, in the United States, most people start the oboe when they start when they're in band in middle school. But a lot of band directors won't actually start students on the oboe. They start them on the more basic instruments, like the flute or the clarinet. Um, and then, a couple of years into it, they'll pick somebody and move them over to the oboe. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, my favorite question from Kevin. Kevin's the only one that gets this many questions, right? Okay, uh, why are oboes called oboes? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, the oboe originally comes from France. And the original French name for the oboe is the aubois. H-A-U-T-B-O-I-S. And cameraman Tally, come here. Would you please tell our, no, come around front. Please tell our friends, because you're in French class. Here's your French class for the day. Oh, bois. What does that translate to in French? High wood. Good work. Yeah, it translates to high wood. Oboes are made out of wood, and they play high. So the au bois was the high wood. Um, you travel to England, and the au bois becomes oboe. And so that's how you get the name the oboe. In uh, German, it's the hobo which is always a good time. Uh, but the other thing that's fun is that when the oboe moves to, um, to England, one of the other things they ended up calling it was uh, because oboe looks like hot boys, in, or hot boys, uh, if you do it phonetically. They actually did call it the hot boy for a while there. So I play the hot boys. Okay, now back to the reed. This reed here is one of the most interesting parts of the oboe. And I got a lot of questions about the reed. Michelle wants to know, how long does it take to make your own reed? And Joseph wants to know, do oboe players really spend statistically half their waking lives making reeds? Um, sometimes, yeah, Joe. Uh, oops, how long is an oboe reed viable? It all depends. And Kelly, Kelsey wants to know, how do you know when a reed is truly done? So I'm gonna show you a little bit about these reeds. So all professional oboes, oboe players actually make their reeds, okay? And it's a really long, drawn-out process. You can, you can buy them made, and there have been a couple of times in emergencies that I've done that, like right after my daughter was born and stuff like that. And student oboe players, a lot of times will purchase reeds, but all professional oboe players make their own reeds. So what I do is I actually get in the mail a bunch of stuff that looks like this. Looks like bamboo, right? The best stuff, like wine, comes from the south of France, although they're experimenting with things from China. And then, you take this splitter here. It's got three little blades. And you split it. There. Now I have three potential reeds, right? And then, you, you spend a lot of time measuring and looking and seeing what's the flattest part. And then you take this here, and on this machine I've got a guillotine, right? Just like Marie Antoinette, and we chop its little head off. Ha ha! Now it is this long, right? Then, you put it on the planer. It's got a blade on there. Wait, I'm gonna use one of these to plane. Now it's more flat, right? That part all goes really fast. Then you've got to soak it for two hours. We're not gonna do that right now. But then, you put it on this machine right here. This is called a gouger, and it's got a little curved blade on the inside. And you put it in the bed, and you go waka 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 waka, and cane goes everywhere, and it makes a grand mess. 
and it's lovely and then you get it out and then it looks skinny like this right and you measure it a lot on the micrometer you see how thick it is in different places that one's 60 micrometers so I usually get through this prepping part I'll like bulk do this like I'll take a few days in the summer and just go bananas and just do as much as I can do right and then I've got a whole bunch of little pieces of cane that I keep around and then every time you go to make a piece of cane you, you have to soak it you take this you fold it you tie it onto the tube you get lots of different kinds of threads and then you take it and you take your knife and you scrape and scrape and scrape and scrape and scrape and scrape and you have a little wood block and you clip and clip and clip and clip and clip and then you play it and then you scrape it and then you clip it and then you play it and then you scrape it and then you clip it and you do all of this and then eventually you get a reed. For instance, these are two different reeds um, that I made right around the same time. And you can see that the basic sound is the same, but if I blow harder, you get slightly different partials to it. And so they probably sound very slightly different. because they're both decent reads. I haven't thrown them away, but there you go. So in answer to the questions, it's hard for me to say how long it takes to make a read because I don't really do it all at once. Um, and I'll usually, even the scraping process, I'll put it out over several days, but you spend a lot of time scraping. I never knew when I decided to play the oboe that I would spend so much time whittling, but you know, everything comes with something like that. Okay, I'm actually playing the oboe. Douglas wants to know, oboists or violists, which are the worst musicians and which are the butts of better jokes? I think we all know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Here's some real questions, Douglas says. Does playing for a long time make the insides of your cheeks and gums hurt? Does your lips buzz and tickle when you play? How do you deal with that? And do oboists have scars like the permanent hickeys the violinists have? Well, you know, you're using your muscles. Your mouth has muscles. And so, yeah, you use them for a while and they get tired and eventually they can get sore. Or if you let yourself get out of shape, they can get really tired and really sore. I'm going to be honest. I did not spend the first part of this week practicing. I was doing other stuff like cooking gallons of soup because that's how I deal with stress. And so I got out my elbow a couple of days ago. I'm like, hi, friend. I haven't seen you in a few days. And I started to play. And after a while, I was like, oh, I haven't used those muscles very much lately. That's a little sore. It's kind of like the way I feel virtually every time I go to the gym, right? Um, yeah, sometimes they do get a little buzzy and they do get a little tickly. But that kind of goes away over time and you don't worry about it too much. Um, no, there are no external scars in playing the oboe, but the internal ones. <laughs> no, not really. I will say this, when I was learning how to make reeds, I did always have to keep band-aids ready because those knives are sharp. And you know, you, without thinking, you'd clean off your knife on your, on your leg or your pants and all of a sudden you need a band-aid. So I'm sure I've got stuff like that. Um, Brenda also wanted to know, does playing the oboe make your face hurt? Um, and Scott wants to know, does it hurt the oboe when you play it? Well, it makes your face hurt a little bit eventually. And Scott, I can't tell you if it makes the oboe hurt. He's never told me. On a scale of one to 10, Tori asks, how nervous do you get every time you have to play to tune the orchestra? So yeah, at the beginning of every orchestra concert, you're gonna notice that the concert master comes out and they look at the oboe player. And they sort of have this telepathy going thing. And then the oboe player has a little tuner and they put it on their stand and they're trying to get it perfect. was a little 
flat and I had to bring it up. Lip pressure. So yeah, that is kind of nerve wracking. Um, my assistant Tally asked last night, she's like, how nervous do you get? I was like, it's like pie on a scale of one to 10. She said, oh, so not too much, but never ending. And I was like, yes, that's a reference to something, but I'm old, so I don't know what it is. And then finally, my last favorite questions. Uh, Tiara asks, do all oboe players secretly hate themselves? Asking for a friend. Hunter asks, is the oboe really just a cry for help? The oboe can be very tricky to play, but it's also really super rewarding. Um, it has the, the sound the most like a human voice, and it can be absolutely glorious to listen to. So the next time that the symphony meets and has a concert, I hope that you come to listen to it, and I hope that you look right in the middle and listen for the oboe player and know a little bit about more what the oboe player is doing and, and be kind of excited about that stuff. Now we've got one more thing I want to do. Okay, so as promised, you're actually going to get a little bit of music and not just me talking. But um, because I am a college professor, you're going to have to live through like 30 seconds of sort of philosophical musings. So in the current crisis where we're all having to social distance from each other, I think it really makes us realize that it's really hard for us to go through things not doing things with other people. And one of the things that I love the most about any kind of music is you know, you spend time by yourself, but that point where you get together and make music with other people. It's hard to do when we're all off in our own houses, right? So, we're gonna try to make music together, y'all and me. So, here's what I want you to do. If you've watched this far, I want you to pause the video. I want you to go get anybody else in your house and make them all come, and we're gonna make music together. I'll wait. Okay, good. You paused it and now you're back. So, this is a piece that I wrote uh, several years ago and it's the first movement. It's called Snap. And here's how you're going to make music. You're going to be snapping and later on you're going to be clapping and then you're going to snap again. That's all you got to do and we're all going to do it together. And to help you get started, we have my able assistant here, Miss Tally Van Emmen. Hi. Okay, so here we go. You ready? You're going to snap. Keep it going.
It's been lovely making music with you. It's been lovely to get to teach you a little bit about the oboe. I hope you're all doing really well. I hope you're doing the best that you can do to keep yourselves occupied and be kind to each other. And I can't wait until I can see you again in the Spartanburg Philharmonic. Bye, y'all.